Turn with me, please, to the book of Titus, chapter 1. We're going to look at several passages today, but I'd like to just point something out about Titus. Titus is a, a wonderful little book. It's a, one of the pastoral epistles. It starts out, Paul starts out in Titus with a couple verses, basically three verses, that uh, sketch for Titus and for those whom Titus was going to minister to, sketch for him and them a view of Paul's own ministry. Notice he starts out by saying, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle. So he describes himself as a servant and an apostle. Apostle means sent one, sent out by God, and specially commissioned. There were 12 of them, as you know. So he describes himself as an apostle. He says that, that his apostleship is for the sake of, or some translations say, according to, the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth. Basically, the idea of that is that, that Paul's apostleship is in agreement with God's, that what, what God's elect believe, the faith of God's elect, and their knowledge. In other words, he's basically claiming that what he preaches is what God's true people believe. And that this accords with godliness, which is another way of saying that you cannot say that God's truth doesn't affect behavior. It accords with godliness. And it's primarily, this faith is primarily about, verse 2, eternal life or hope in hope for it, hope of it, uh, eternal life which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. So that tells you that God has been promising or planning on bringing eternal life into the world from before the foundation of the world. But at the proper time, he manifested this eternal life in his word through the preaching with which I've been entrusted. This is where Paul comes in. God planned eternal life before the foundation of the world. Didn't just plan it, he promised it to somebody. I wonder who he promised it to. Who do you think he promised eternal life to before there was anybody to promise to? He promised it to the angels. I have a feeling that he promised, the Father promised it to the Son in the eternal transactions from before the foundation of the world. So God promised eternal life before the foundation of the world, and then he manifested that eternal life that he had been thinking about for forever through Paul's preaching. Would you say that that makes Paul pretty significant? Yeah. <laughs> the message that Paul has brought into the world is the eternal redemption. Ephesians 3.11 says it's a redemption in Christ is, is eternal. It uses the word eternal to describe it. God's plan to bring Christ into the world was eternal. And so Paul's message is um, dramatically important, hugely important. It is the revelation of mysteries that were um, not just hidden in the heart of the Father, but um, covenanted between the Father and the Son before the world was. Now, the significant thing here is that if this preaching that we have in our Bibles and all of his epistles, and of course it's not just Paul, but it's all the apostles, this preaching that we have, this precious gift that God has given to us, entrusted, it has to be perpetuated. It's not enough that it remain in a book, though this is a treasure beyond all treasures. But it has to be perpetuated. It has to be propagated. It's pro propagated through translating into other languages. But the way he discusses Next, how God propagates it is through the ministry of elders. Verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town. What's the point of elders? To propagate God's eternal salvation, to never ceasingly proclaim it, rejoice in it, that God's elect might be drawn in and brought in to the fold and then nourished there once they're brought in. Now, there's nothing more common among Christendom, sad, tragically, than autonomy. And this is a tendency to rely on our own understanding when evaluating issues. But biblical doctrine is supposed to be based on the Bible. 
There's hardly anything more common than people autonomously making pronouncements about what elders are supposed to be and do. That is one of the most common things that I've been able to discern, common mistakes that I've been able to discern among Christian people. It's so easy to rely and lean upon your own understanding when it comes to what a pastor is supposed to be and do. And this occurs because people make idols out of pastors and they place undue expectations on them. But it raises the question, what exactly is the role of elder? If everybody's wanting to define it themselves, if everybody has a very quick idea of what an elder should be about doing or what an elder should be, should be and what his, his uh, primary task should be, if everybody has it, their own, own idea, then what does the Bible say about it? Let the Bible speak, as somebody once said. How does the Lord himself define the role of elder? And that is what I want to talk about today, the role of elder in the plan of God, not the plan of man, but the plan of God. So today we're going to look at several of the most on-point relevant passages to discern the gist of what God says about this. We're going to go on a mission of exploration. We're going to do an investigative search through the Bible in order to just determine what God says about elders. What are they? What are they supposed to be doing? What's their job description? And what sort of people are they supposed to be? I mean, you have to, you have to admit, if God is, in, is propagating and promoting his grand and eternal salvation in Christ, one primary way he's doing it is through the ministry of elders, you'd have to admit uh, that's a pretty important role, and we better know what they are and how they're supposed to do things. Have you ever thought of a pastor that way, as, as Paul describes it, a clay pot, but inside's a what? Remember what he said? There's something in an earthen vessel. What's in that earthen vessel? He says, treasure. Treasure in an earthen vessel. That's what a pastor's supposed to be. He's just a clay pot. That's what an earthen vessel, you want to know a modern, uh, you know, a modern way of saying earthen vessel? Clay pot, right? But there's a treasure inside, not because of it's him, but because of the message he carries. And so uh, we need to define this according to the Bible. So we're going to go on a mission of exploration. This is going to be a different kind of message today. Instead of looking for an idea to jot down, this is how you need to think as you're listening to this. Note the passages I bring up and the points that I make from them. They're going to be brief points because I'm going to bring up quite a few passages. So jot down the passages. What you're going to end up with is a helpful treasure chest, a kind of a gathering together of a bunch of verses and passages in your Bible that, that's all about eldership. And so you'll have God's mind on it. You're not going to have everything on the topic, but you'll have a lot. You're going to have some crucial concepts You'll end up with the core principles, the core idea that you can add to as you dis discover more passages, okay? So that's what we're doing today. We're going to look at what the Bible says about elders so we can discern the tenor of the Bible on this topic, the basic idea. And your job is just to jot down the references, and then if you can, jot down the ideas that I pull out of those references for you. I've already pulled something out for you from Titus 1. I just noted several things. Uh, one main idea that God, that Paul talks about his role in the, in the eternal plan of God, and then I just noted that the eldership, eldership perpetuates that role by taking the Pauline message and constantly preaching it. So that God's salvation is constantly being heralded from thousands and thousands of pulpits all over this world all the time. I'd say that's pretty exciting. And when you see that big picture, suddenly pastors, the role of pastor becomes a precious thing. And so, let's go ahead and take a look at this. I'm going to give you eight, seven or eight points here. Let's see how many I can get through here. Number one, remember we're looking at passages right now, not ideas. So right now you're waiting for a passage. You ready? Number one, first passage. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. You can turn over there if you'd like. 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. I'm going to read this passage for you. So if you want to, you can just jot it down. And then listen to me read it. But it's way better if you read it along with me. So while I'm blabbering right now about these technical matters, you can be quickly turning over to 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4, and taking a look at that passage. And I'll begin reading in verse uh, 1. 1 Peter 5. Let's find out what it says about elders. This is Peter saying, The elders who are among you I exhort. 
I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. By the way, I'm going to be reading all these in the New King James Version, not because I'm choosing the New King James Version, but because of something that just happened in my study. So, excuse me. New King James Version. Here we go. The elders who are among you I exhort, I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. He says to the elders, this is Peter, he's saying to the elders, verse 2, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What is he giving to us here in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 4? Well, he gives us certain terms. I want you to notice that. He calls them elders. That's presbyteros. See, I, who am a fellow elder, to the elders, and so on. He uses the word presbyteros, which is um, a term that refers to the same office as pastor. Notice he even uses the term pastor in verse 2. Shepherd, that's the verb form of it. You could, you could translate that, pastor the flock. Pastor the flock of God which is among you. And then you see that he uses a third term, overseers, serving as overseers. That's episkopos, which basically is the word translated bishop in the King James Version in First. Timothy chapter 3, this simply means somebody who has kind of a supervisory role. He's a supervisor, he's an overseer. So you have the three terms, elder, pastor, overseer. They all mean the same thing. They're referring to the same office, I should say. Different takes on the same office. And then you'll notice that the passage also gives you a short description of the role. You see that? Look at verse 2 gives you a short description of the role. He says, shepherd, that is pastor, or feed, feed the flock. What do, what, do, what do shepherds do? What do shepherds do? They bring the flock all together. All together now, right? You don't want the, the, the sheep going everywhere, so they have to stay together. So unity, unity, right? Keep the flock together. Let's get into the, let's get into the pasture so you can what? Eat. And there better be a water supply because you need to drink too. Oh, and I'm going to keep my eye out for what? Wolves. Okay, there's the shepherd's role. You feed the flock, make sure they're nourished. That's the word of God. What's the food for the Christian? The word of God. And then there's false teachers that need to be pointed out, false teaching that needs to be pointed out so that people can know and identify it. Okay. So that's basically the idea of shepherd. So shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. They need to take responsibility and provide oversight and guidance for the flock. And they need to do it not by compulsion, but they need to do it willingly and eagerly. And they shouldn't be out for dishonest gain. So he's weighing in on motives here. And they need to do it not coercively, verse 3, not as being lords over, over those entrusted to you, but being examples. That's, that fits with other passages where Jesus says, for example, um, you've seen the lords of the Gentiles, they lord it over their people, but that's not the way it's going to be with you. There's not supposed to be any coercive, you will obey me kind of ministry. Okay. No, it needs to be very different than that. It cannot be overbearing. It cannot be coercive. There's such a thing, and I want to preach a sermon on this, called evangelical obedience. The Puritans used to talk about evangelical obedience a lot. That's a really, really important concept. You see that coming out here. The pastor is supposed to use his authority a certain way and not be heavy-handed with it. And verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears, that means the pastor is an under-shepherd, under the chief shepherd Christ, an under-pastor, you might say. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's Christ, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So what you have in, th in this uh, beautiful couple verses, few verses, is you have a short description of the role. And it focuses on the primary responsibility, pastoring, feeding the flock, and then proper motives and manner. Proper motives and manner. 
uh, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not being lords over them, but being examples. You can see that he's providing some really helpful details on how to go about this. Make sure your motives are right. He identifies two false motives, and then make sure your manner is correct. Don't be a lord over them. Don't coerce them, but lead them along. Point them to the chief shepherd. Be an example. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Super important passage. Short, short description, basic responsibilities, motives, and manner. Let's turn over to Ephesians 4. Remember, you're looking for texts, passages, so I'm giving you your second one. Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16. Here, Paul gives several points about the purpose. He especially focuses on the purpose and goals of Eldership. What are elders supposed to be shooting for? What's their goal in their ministry? Well, in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16, Paul really concentrates on what the goal of a pastor is supposed to be. And this shows you something about modern ministry that is utterly crucial to understand. That many, many uh, modern ministries are not nearly serious enough. Because when you read what Paul says in Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 16, it's just mind-blowingly serious. Let me get, begin reading in verse 11. He says in verse 11, I'm going I'm to highlight some, some of the, the words in this. So note where I highlight. You can even underline them in your Bible if you want. But note where I highlight the words and they'll show you the purposes. Remember I said these are God's purposes for elders. So I'm going to highlight the words that underline and highlight the purposes. So beginning in verse 11, Christ himself gave some apostles, some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay, well, what was the purpose of God, of God giving us these? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. There's one purpose. So one purpose of pastors and teachers, remember, apostles laid down the foundation in the, in the Bible. We read that, remember? That's, that was God's goal for Paul and the other apostles. They laid the foundation in the Bible. And they preached it. They preached the message too. But pastors and teachers, their job is to propagate what the apostles laid down. Okay, so they... Keep, keep it going. They don't make up new stuff. They teach the word. They preach the word that the apostles laid down. So you can say that the apostles and pastors and teachers have not exactly the identical role, but they have a very similar role. The apostles were the originators through the, under the inspiration of the Spirit, of course, and then pastors are propagators of what they originated. But it's the same. It ought to be the same message. <laughs> So verse 12, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Here's another one, for the edifying of the body of Christ. There's two purposes. Look at verse 13. He tells you how long these purposes are going to need to be in place. I mean, how long are we going to need pastors anyways? Hasn't it come to the point where we can just say we're done with pastors and elders? No, look at verse 13. Till, how long is this supposed to be going on? How long do we need pastors to propagate the message? Verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Well, that means we're going to need it until the very end. Because believe me, how many of you are going to raise your hand and say, yes, I've come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. You ready? All together now, put your hand up if you want to be that arrogant. Yes, I'm perfect now. Okay, I don't think so. See, that's the point. None of, we, we all need to grow, and so we all need pastors. And we're going to need them until we come to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of Christ's fullness. Verse 14 gives you another purpose for pastors, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So you can see that the primary, I would say the primary purpose of the elder role, according to Ephesians 4, is to mature the flock. So that means if you have pastors who are flippant, what are they doing? Flippant 
lighthearted pastor that's always making jokes and never really gets into the word and never digs and digs and shovels out meat for the people to eat and, and so on. Not really serious minded about his task. What's he doing? He's doing exactly the opposite of what he's supposed to be doing. That's why I said earlier that this is serious. We're supposed to be maturing the flock. I'm going to stop there and go on to the next verse. Okay, I think I've done enough um, from Ephesians 4. I'm, of course, just dipping in here. But Ephesians 4 basically gives us God's purposes and goals for elders and how long they need to be in place in the church all the way to the end. What have we seen so far? 1 Peter 5 told us um, the basic responsibilities and the proper motives in the proper manner. And Ephesians 4 tells us the proper goals and length of time for this role. Now let's go over to Titus 1. We looked at it already once, but we'll look at it again briefly. Verses 5 through 9. Titus 1, this is your third reference. Titus 1, 5 through 9. This one, as we noted earlier, gives us qualifications for elders. Basically, these qualifications tell us that elders cannot be notorious sinners. And it's easy when you look at these. I mean, just take a look at it. Um, look at verse 7. For a bishop must be blameless as, as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, and so on. Okay, It's easy to read these and go, okay, well, he's not supposed to be quick-tempered. Boy, if I ever notice the slightest lack of um, kindness in my pastor, I'm going to say, you are not qualified, okay? Um, he, you know, it, it's easy to look at these as though they were absolutes, as though they were saying, and they are absolutes, of course, they're absolutely true, but it's easy to look at these as if they were saying that a pastor can't ever have done these things, can't ever do these things, or can't struggle with them at all. That's not what these are saying. He's saying that they can't be marked by these qualities, these sinful qualities. And then when he gets towards the end of this section to positive qualities like hospitable, verse 8, and so on, the pastor needs to be marked by those. Okay? So uh, let's read through this then, understanding it that way. The elder cannot be notorious for certain sins. Here we go. For this reason, verse 5, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. If a man is blameless... The husband of one wife. Now that is an absolute. You can't, I mean, you can't be a husband of one wife and then the next day be the husband of two wives, okay? You have to just be the husband of one wife. That's basically saying a man cannot be a polygamist. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of dissipation or insubordination. It means his family has got to be in order for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful word as he's been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Wow, would you say that's pretty heavy? What are you noticing about the Bible? It says a lot about elders. Why do you think that is? Because this is an absolutely crucial role. It's the way God is propagating his gospel in the earth. It's one of the main ways he does that. So here you have qualifications. You find out that this particular man um, needs, to, needs to be a very godly individual. That means if somebody comes up to you and says, I want to be a pastor, and then you, dis you, you discern that they've got porn problems in their life, that you want to tell them, you know what, you can't be a pastor. Or if somebody wants to be a pastor, but they can't speak kind words to anybody, you need to say, you can't be a pastor. You're marked by being hostile. Or somebody who's given to wine. That is, they're a drunkard. 
These things are utterly, utterly crucial. They're the qualifications for candidates. I want to just uh, make another statement here. These qualifications are the important ones. Sometimes somebody will come along and they will say, this guy can't be a pastor because, and then they'll say something, they'll fill in the blank. And I'll think, that's not in the Bible. Where did they come up with that qualification? <laughs> Why aren't they mentioning the qualifications that are in the Bible? Okay. You see how easy it is to end up just kind of relying on your own understanding. Okay, let's go on to a fourth uh, text here. So we've looked at several texts. Your job right now is to jot these down so you have them. You have the texts that talk about eldership. Okay, let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4. This is the apostolic exhortation to an elder. And in this, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, he tells us the main task and how to carry that task out and why to keep at it, okay? So he's going to tell you what the main task is, and that is, of course, preach the word, verse 2. And boy, does he solemnly charge Timothy. He says in verse 1, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Can it get any more solemn than this? I mean, if, if somebody came up to you and started saying those words, you would suddenly feel like trembling if you were really listening to them. He says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. You, elder, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Okay, so he's given the main task, and then he said how to carry that task out. Rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Or, excuse me, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. That is super important to take into, into hand because um, if you convince and rebuke and exhort but without the patience, then you're going to be mean. But if you're just patient and you never convince, rebuke, and exhort, then you're not really helping the sheep to follow Christ because sheep do what? They go astray. And so you have to, you have to rebuke the people, but it has to be done with all long-suffering and careful instruction. What an incredibly helpful piece of advice for pastors. And then he gives the reason why to keep at preaching the word. He says, because the sheep are going to just say, forget this sound doctrine business. Verse 3 and 4 and 5. You see that, verse 3? Because, or 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires... Um, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn, turn away their ears from the truth and turn to fables. What a, what a motivation for keeping. Keep at it because everybody's going to reject you. Okay, what, what kind of motivation is that? That's what he's saying. You better keep at it because the whole flock is going to say, we're tired of this sound doctrine business. Let's have some fables. How could that be motivating to Timothy? It can be motivating to know that he's got a certain window of time to give the word before people are going to tire of the truth and turn to fables. So you better maximize your opportunity. That's the logic there. So you can see what he's saying to Timothy. He's saying, here's the main task, preach the word. Here's how to carry it out. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And then I want you to keep at it because they're going to, they're going to give up. Wow, Paul. You know, Paul wrote this at the end of his life. He wrote 2 Timothy at the end of his life because he knew people, and he'd probably seen it many, many, many times. And if you think, oh, that's an overly pessimistic view of the church. I mean, the church is supposed to be filled with a bunch of godly people. That's an overly, overly pessimistic view of the church. Remember what God told, uh, Christ told the, the, um, age, the churches in Asia Minor in Revelations 3 and 4, Revelation chapter 3 and 4. He'd say things like, watch it or I'll take your lampstand away. It's not overly pessimistic at all. People get tired of God. It happens all the time. Make sure it doesn't happen to you. 
Look at chapter five, or fifth one, Matthew 13. So we've looked at, let me give you the verses again. I hope you're valuing this grouping of verses I'm giving you because these are the biggies. 1 Peter 5, Ephesians 4, Titus 1, and 2 Timothy 4. Okay? Now let's take a look at Matthew 13, verse 52. I love this verse. This was the verse that the Lord impressed upon my own heart years ago when I became a pastor. I realized that this was what I wanted to do. This was my spiritual gift. This was my bent. And this was the thing that got me excited and made me want to get up in the morning. Matthew 13, verse 52. At the, after he's taught all these parables to them, he says to them, Therefore, he asks them, do, do you understand these things? And they, of course, in their arrogance say, Oh, of course we do, even though they don't. <laughs> but, you know, the, the apostles say, Of course we understand these things. And then he graciously gives them some instruction about that. He says, Okay, therefore, every scribe, that includes every one of you, he's basically saying to them, to the teachers of the Christian church, he says, every scribe instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. Now that may not communicate to us at all because we never use the term householder anymore, but it's just talking about an estate holder. And he's got a treasure, that is, that is he's got a room in his house where he stores up all of his goods. And he's got in there stuff old and stuff new. And what he's basically saying to the apostles is, okay, you're like that, a state holder, and you've got a really big storage room, and you've learned all this stuff from me, and it's, some of it's new. But you've also got old stuff from the Old Testament, and now you're going to have new stuff from the New Testament, and you need to make sure you have a storage room stocked, filled, so you can bring out all the goods to, for the people. Because remember, being a good teacher is like feeding people. And I remember thinking, that's what I want to do. I want to have a really big storage room filled with good things that I can give to people so they can serve God and love God and worship God and get, excite, get excited about God too. That's the heart of a pastor. Not just so that you can get excited, but a pastor knows that we are strengthened by the word of God in a spirit-filled heart. We're empowered in our spirit, in our inner person. We're we're honoring God with a clean heart. When we have a clean heart, we honor God. We glorify him as we ought to. And our, our lives become more holy and more heavenly and less carnal and miserable. And so it's the best way to help people is to have a well-stocked larder to feed them. Matthew 13, 52. That's an essential characteristic of an elder. Let me give you another verse. Sixth, sixth verse. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Here's a helpful label for that essential characteristic that I just showed you from Matthew 13, 52. Here's a helpful label that sums up that characteristic. I mean, you could say householder, but that, I don't think that really does it for me personally. I'd like to have a, a, a nether label alongside that one to help me understand that role even more. And 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 gives it. It says, let a man so consider us. Now, he's not talking just about the apostles here. He's talking about uh, Apollos, who was not an apostle. He was a preacher. So he's talking about apostles who preach and also preachers. He's saying, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and, here it is, stewards of the mysteries of God. Stewards of the mysteries of God. You know what a steward is? If you, had, if you had a financial manager who managed your financial affairs, that would be what they used to call a financial steward, somebody whose job it was to organize your financial affairs and get them in order and keep them in order and inform you about them and so on. A pastor is a steward of the mysteries of God. He doesn't just steward them for himself, but he stewards them and organizes them and understands them so that he can dish it out to the people of God. But the question is, what's the mystery of God? We're not talking about Sherlock Holmes here. We're talking, and we're not talking about something that's mysterious. Let me show you a couple texts. Um, I'm going to show you four, and I'm going to turn to them at light speed, okay, because of time. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. Let's see if I can still turn fast. Matthew 13, 11 says, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom, or the mysteries of the kingdom. 
He says to the apostles, you are to know, it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And then I'm going to turn over to Romans chapter 16, verse 30, or 25, where he says, Paul says something very similar here at the end of Romans, verse 25. He says, now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. In other words, the preaching of Jesus Christ is in agreement with the revelation of the mystery. God has revealed the mystery. Matthew 13, it is yours to know the mystery. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. I'm already there, so I'll read it. It says, but we, we, that is we apostles, we teachers of the Christian church, that in, would include elders, we impart a secret and hidden wisdom. That is a mystery. We impart a mystery. And then look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. He uses the same language in Ephesians 1, and you'll see my point in, uh, in referencing these four texts in just a second. He says in verse one, uh, 7 of Ephesians 1, he says, In Christ we have redemption through his blood. Oops, this is not the text. That's too, Oh, it's verse uh, 9. Making known to us, this is Ephesians 1, 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. There's the word again. Notice these texts. Matthew 13, 11, it's yours to know the mystery. Romans 16, 25, God's revealed the mystery. Ephesians 1, 9, God has made known the mystery. In other words, a mystery is not a mystery anymore. A mystery is something that would have been mysterious had God not revealed it. And that means being a steward of God's mysteries, which is what a teacher is supposed to be, a Bible teacher is supposed to be. Being a steward of God's mysteries means... Properly understanding and remembering and studying and teaching God's word, God's message. And somebody recently called it, they, they coined a term, I think, just recently. I'm not sure how long this term's been around, but this means that an elder is supposed to be a public theologian, and this is how he pastors the flock. See, people think, how does, how does, a, how does a pastor pastor the flock? And they just kind of come up in their own mind of what that looks like. Did you know that the Bible says that a pastor is supposed to steward the mysteries of God? That means organize, understand, study, get deep with it, and then feed it to the people. He's a public theologian. He gathers them all together and leads them to the green pastures. The way he pastors the flock is by shepherding them into the green pastures of God's word. The way he pastors the flock is by shepherding them into the green pastures of God's word. That means if you're sitting there spacing out all the time, then you're doing what? If you're sitting in church spacing out all the time, then you're doing what? You're the shepherd, the little black, not shepherd, excuse me, you're the sheep, the little black sheep going, nope, I'll go this way. Okay? That's what spacing out of church is. Okay. Spacing out of church is basically saying, no, God, I don't want to be shepherded. It's a big deal. A huge deal. Did you know how, how Jesus described um, the preaching of the word of God? He described it in the parable of the sower. And he said, I cast out the seed and some seed falls on what? The wayside soil. And that's, that's the soil that it doesn't sink down in. And the, the, the bird just comes along and does what? The birds, the crows come and they just eat the seed. An elder is a public theologian. The way he pastors the flock is by shepherding them into the green pastures of God's word. They are, pa pastors are supposed to be stewards of the, of the mysteries of God. That is, mysteries that have been revealed by God's Gracious kindness to us. And then seventhly, here's a passel of text that I just had to cram into one point because I didn't want to have ten points. Let me give you several texts that show you what the church's regard for elders is supposed to be. Almost done here. These verses show you, and this is just a sampling because there's more than just these three. But they show you what the church's regard for elders is supposed to be. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13 says, We urge you, brothers, to recognize or know those who labor among you 
and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. If the primary purpose of elders is to disseminate the word of God, then note those who labor in the word and doctrine and doubly honor them because they are, they are meeting the very purpose of their existence. They're fulfilling the very purpose of their existence. It's to get the word out there. You can see why the Westminster Confession would say that um, one of the ordinances of Christ is the preaching of the word of God and the conscionable hearing of it. That if we're to honor God and his purposes in the world, if, if God's great redemption from the covenant of redemption before the foundation of the world came into this world through the ministries of the prophets and especially the ministry of Jesus the Messiah and then carried on into the ministry of the apostles is now being disseminated abroad by pastors everywhere, people need to come and sit under the preaching and benefit from it because that's God's kingdom going forth. It's a big deal what happens here on Sunday mornings and what happens in pulpits all over this world on Sunday mornings or afternoons, whatever the case may be. Hebrews 13.7 is another text on this point. The church's regard for elders. Remember those who rule over you who have spoken the word of God to you. Obey those, verse 17, who rule over you and be submissive. I want to comment on this. Um, one of the things that I tell men, uh, abusive men, um, when, I, when I counsel them, and I've had to counsel some abusive men over the years, one of the things that I tell them, at least I've gotten used to telling it to them, is that you, your job is not to make your wife submit. You, you've made a big mistake, I'll tell them. You think that it's your job to make her submit. And there's nothing in the Bible that says, husbands, make your wives submit. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. And then it says to wives, submit yourselves. It's their job to submit to their husbands. If you, if you were talking with a husband and you could tell that they thought that it was their job to make their wives submit, how do you think that they were treating them, their wives? Abusively. That's called coercion. They're coercing their wives. They might as well be Muslims. That's what Muslims do. It's exactly the same thing here. Notice, the people are told, obey those who have the rule over you. But the pastors are told, make sure you don't lord it over them. It's exactly the same thing. It's up to the people if they're going to obey. But they will be held accountable before the Lord for it. And then finally, eighth. So the seventh point was the church's regard for elders, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Timothy 5, Hebrews 13. And then my eighth point here, last one, and I'm almost done, is there's a need for councils and presbyteries from time to time. Acts 15, 6, there's a doctrinal dispute, and they got the, the apostles and elders together to, to resolve it. So there was a council of elders to resolve a doctrinal dispute. And then in 1 Timothy 4.14, they gathered a council of elders called a presbytery to ordain a person to be an elder, which is what we're going to be doing in a couple weeks. So they had councils of elders to resolve disputes, Acts 15.6, and they had presbyteries or gatherings or councils of elders to ordain elders. And that, like I said, is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be calling a presbytery. We've got elders coming from several places in the United States, and they're going to be gathered here in two weeks on Saturday, the 30th. Is it 2.30? Yeah, 2.30. There's an important detail. Another role of elders is to help out the other elder. Thank you, Mark. He knew it was 2.30. Um, so, yeah, 2.30 on Saturday, the 30th. We're going to have... Um, probably maybe six or eight guys, elders, who are going to be here. Mark's going to be in the hot seat, which basically just means that we're going to be asking him questions about his life and his um, doctrine. Okay? Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. 
Paul tells Timothy. So we're going to be taking those two angles, and we're going to be just publicly questioning him, and he's going to answer um, honestly, and he's going to show how much doctrine he knows. And I'm excited about that because Mark's been, you know, he, I'm sure he, he knows about Matthew 13, 52 as well, and he's been gathering lots of knowledge for decades of his life. And uh, if you, you're all invited to come, of course, you won't be able to ask questions. The presbytery will be doing that. Um, but you'll be able to listen in and learn. You're going to learn a lot from Mark and hopefully from some of the pastors who will probably ask some really good questions, I'm guessing. Um, and then what, the, what the, the presbytery will do is they will confer and then recommend that the church go ahead and ordain Mark and call him to be uh, the second elder of our church. And that means the following day, on the 31st, we're going to have the laying on of the hands. Remember that statement from 1 uh, Timothy 4.14? Um, the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Basically what that means is that the, the council of elders will literally place their hands on Mark's shoulders as a symbol of God ordaining Mark and, and putting him into that role, that precious role of elder. Why is it precious? Let me just make this very clear in closing. Sometimes when elders talk about elders, people don't like it very much because it sounds like they're puffing themselves up. That has not been what has been going on here. Okay. I'm not puffing Mark up. Mark's not puffing me up. I'm not puffing myself up. What makes elders precious? Elders are precious because they are part of the plan of God of disseminating and lifting up and exalting God's Christ and his gospel. That is what it's all about. And may God bless our church as we have the blessed privilege of being a part of seeing that go forth in the earth. Is this not a needy world? This is such a needy world. What's the answer? This. This is the answer. If they will, who have ears to hear will hear it. But if they won't hear it, they too will stand before God and give an account.